Hey guys, so I know that many of you are totally confused, not confused, I don't want to say that because I want to hope that you have some idea of what we're doing uh, with muscle contraction, but I wanted to record a video of that happening because I, I heard a bunch of you at the review session last night say that would be exceptionally helpful. So here we go. Um, you're seeing it on this board a graphic of what I've already given you just in a little bit of color, so that might help you as well. But I'm going to talk through this. You can watch this a thousand times if you want to watch it a thousand times. Um, just to give you an idea of, of once again, uh, the steps that are kind of preceding then the whole ability for you to contract muscle. So we start up here with the neuron itself. Don't forget that when we have this neuron, it's all being conducted by the brain. This is voluntary action. So you have your brain, let's just say up here, the brain is going to send these action potentials, which remember is electrical energy. And that electrical energy that we have is being sent down the actual neuron itself. But this is the, and I've labeled it, the synaptic end bulb. So this whole structure that you see right here is the synaptic end bulb. We find that it's full of these vesicles. These vesicles, don't forget, they contain acetylcholine. So these are going to be ACH uh, molecules in there. And once this action potential comes down here, it kind of electrifies this synaptic end bulb. Um, calcium and things are going to come into play there. Don't worry about that for this exam. But what you'll see is that these vesicles then exocytose their acetylcholine into this cleft. And once you exocytose your acetylcholine into this cleft, which is this space, this whole thing would be called the neuromuscular junction because I've got a neuron coming in contact with this is my muscle cell. Okay, so once I dump this acetylcholine into this cleft, so these guys are going to dump their acetylcholine in, that acetylcholine wants to bind. Remember, it has an affinity for these ligand-gated sodium channels. And so I've mentioned to you this is going to be the motor end plate. This is the area, the beginning area of the muscle that comes in contact there with the neuron. And so this area, the activation area, contains ligand-gated sodium channels. So acetylcholine wants to come down here and bind to these channels. And sure enough, once it does, because these are sodium channels, they're going to allow sodium in. And so we'll find that Na plus is going to begin to rush in here as quick as it can, because we know that by our concentration gradient, that's exactly what, that, what is going to happen there. So sodium begins to rush in. But before I talk about what happens at this point, we have to recognize that at rest, our cell is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, this negative 70 millivolts is your kind of happy place. Once I begin to rush in all of this sodium that I'm brought, bringing in from these ligand gated channels, that increases my potential. And in this instance, we tell you that it increases it over there to about a negative 55. Now, once I reach this negative 55 millivolts, we know that that is a threshold value. That's a special voltage. And in this case, what that special voltage does is it allows then for the actual voltage gated channels, and I have those listed down here, the voltage gated channels are the ones along the outside of the membrane, and it activates those. And so because I've reached a special voltage, these voltage gated channels begin to open, and they are going to then also, every time I activate one, they bring in more sodium, and they activate the another. So this one is going to be activated, and it's going to bring in sodium, and that brings this one negative 55, and it brings in more sodium, and then this one brings, so what you find is that the voltage gated channels allow for propagation, okay? And so you can see, and I've drawn all those in, so this is going to allow for depolarization all the way down my cell, and you can see at that point that they would allow for in this case, uh, the movement or the propagation of this signal. So I propagate that down. You can see that you'll end up forming an action potential down the T-tubules, up and down in this case. And what I'm going to end up formulating is ultimately the ability of my SR. And you can see it's very lightly shown in green here. This is the SR. The SR to release calcium. So I electrify this SR. I've spread this potential down through my T-tubules, all of that down the muscle cell by voltage-gated channels. I electrify that SR, and SR then begins to release calcium, okay? And that calcium then um, is going to come over here, and I didn't draw it in very well, but this would be exemplifying your sarcomere. And this sarcomere then, which we know contains the ability for our uh, sliding filament mechanism to begin. Once calcium is released from the SR, it goes over there and it binds to troponin. Now, let me just talk you through this process. Troponin then, uh, as we have calcium coming in and binding, troponin and tropomyosin are regulatory proteins. Once calcium binds to troponin, I had mentioned to you in class, it's kind of like mom. Uh, mom is able then 
to convince dad to open myosin, to roll over, exposing then the binding sites for myosin that are on actin. So now myosin gets to come up and bind to actin. So let's just pretend for a moment that I'm looking at actin, myosin's down here. In order for myosin though to come up and bind, myosin has to have ATP hydrolysis. So we have an ATP on the head of myosin there. We hydrolyze it. We form ADP and a phosphate that energizes that head. I'm able then, or myosin is able to go up there and bind to actin. Once that is done, that is called the cross bridge formation. That's the second step. So ATP hydrolysis is number one. The second thing is cross bridge. That's just simply attachment. Once that occurs, then we go undergo power stroke, and that is the physical pulling of actin toward the inline. Once we get to that point, though, if you can remember, uh, myosin is kind of stuck. I don't have the ability to move any further. We have that head, um, the textbook will say it's cocked in that position, allowing then no further movement. In order for me to move further, I have to bring in another ATP. Another ATP comes in and binds to myosin. I can detach at that point. Then what we'll do is go back to step one. I'll hydrolyze the ATP, come up and bind again, power stroke, detach. If I bring in another ATP, hydrolyze that ATP. And this thing happens and happens and happens. So remember, I had mentioned to you that in order for this to go, in order for this to be effective for the sliding filament, I have to have ATP, okay? And I have to have calcium because if calcium ever decides to go back to the SR, we relax the muscle and we can no longer use it at that point in time. So uh, a couple of things that I would just kind of clarify over here. This is your activation area. The activation of this muscle requires acetylcholine, which ultimately is dependent on the brain signals. Okay, When you go all the way through, we've activated this muscle, we've depolarized it. I'm able now to produce a new action potential here by my voltage-gated channels. I come over here to the sliding filament. In order for sliding filament to continue to work, I need at this point calcium and ATP. If I, if I don't have ATP without ATP, I undergo things like rigor mortis, which we've talked about, is um, dealing with death there at that point in time because I cannot detach. I'm stuck there in that position as myosin and Atkins relationship. So hopefully this helps you out a little bit. Watch this over and over and over again if you need to. Um, excitation, contraction, coupling in a nutshell. Um, and email me if you guys have any more questions. Good luck.